Hello, everybody. Uh, we are going to talk about some Taylor series stuff today. And what we're going to talk about is Taylor remainder with Lagrange error bound. So what I really want to make sure that you understand is what we've been doing so far is making these polynomial approximations of non-polynomial functions, aka Taylor or McLaurin series. But we obviously can't write every single term out. So we've often said, hey, just write out the first four terms and then maybe give the general term. The next question is, well, what if I do only write four terms out? How off am I going to be? So if you think to when I've been typing things into the Desmos calculator and we've been like approximating sign, anytime I stop writing the polynomial terms, that means the polynomial is going to kind of shoot off into space, whereas the sine curve doesn't. And so the idea is, how far do I need to go so that I stay within one-tenth of the actual value or whatever, okay? And that's what this Taylor with remainder, also known as Lagrange error bound is, okay? So Taylor's theorem with remainder says the following. It says, if you write out a Taylor series and you stop at the nth term, it's not going to match the function perfectly because you stopped. And so you could add a plus Rn of x where R stands for the remainder, AKA the distance between your polynomial and the curve you're trying to approximate. And that remainder term is the nth plus one derivative at some random value of C that you would have to maybe solve for, divided by n plus one factorial, x minus a to the n plus one. And what I want you to realize is this is just a modification of the first omitted term. Kind of. Okay, because it's technically not the first omitted term, because this c is some random value of c that you would plug into the n plus one derivative. Okay, well, that's if I want to find the exact remainder. And to be honest, it's really hard to do that. So what we often do instead is we find the Lagrange error bound. And instead of making a whole new box for that, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to modify this box. And we're going to say the Lagrange error bound says the following. If I want to find the most amount I'd be off from my real value versus my approximate value, that error is going to be less than or equal to the maximum value of the n plus 1th derivative divided by n plus 1 factorial times x minus a, where a is your center, to the n plus 1. Okay? So this is a very quick, rough explanation of finding Lagrange error bound. So let me show you how it works, and I think once you see it, it'll make more sense. So example 1 says, let f be a function with five derivatives on the interval from 2 to 3 and assume that the fifth the derivative of x is less than 0.2 for all x on the interval from 2 to 3. If the fourth degree Taylor polynomial for f centered at 2 is used to estimate f of 3, how accurate is this approximation? Use the Lagrange error bound. Okay, so let me give you like a pictorial understanding of maybe what we're doing here. So let's say I want to um, approximate a function and I want to center it at x equals 2. So I'm just going to draw a wiggly function. There's 2. There's 3. Let's say I wanted to draw this function. Okay, why did it do that? I want to draw that function. And in order to draw that function, I decide to make an x to the fourth, a fourth degree Taylor polynomial that approximates it. Well, let's see, a fourth degree Taylor polynomial would probably look like a w, so it might look something like this. And it would be glued right here at two. I didn't do a perfect job there. It would be glued right there at two, and it would approximate that original function. It could look like that. If I was more careful, maybe it sticks around a little bit longer, okay? That would be a fourth degree Taylor approximation to that black curve. Fine. Well, I didn't keep going. If I had done a fifth degree, it would have been better. A sixth degree, even better, and so on and so forth. 
we want to know how accurate is that approximation at x equals 3. In other words, how far apart might these be? I'm not going to figure out exactly how far apart they are, but how far apart might they be? This is the Lagrange error bound. So the Lagrange error bound says the error is less than or equal to the maximum value of the n plus 1th derivative, okay, over n plus 1 factorial x minus a to the n plus 1. So our error is less than or equal to. Now, in my numerator, oh, and by the way, this should really have an absolute value because when we talk about error, um, we, we talk about the absolute value of the error. Um, if I want to plug something in, the first thing I need to know is what's the maximum value of that derivative on top? Well, good for us. We know that the fifth derivative is always less than 0.2. So since we stopped at the fourth degree Taylor polynomial, I want to find the maximum value of the fifth derivative divided by 5 factorial x minus 2 to the fifth. In other words, if you stop at the fourth degree, you use fives in the error bound. And if you're centered at two, you use two in parentheses. My maximum value of my fifth derivative is apparently 0.2 over 5 factorial. And then over here, 2 is where you're centered. x is what you're estimating. We want to estimate f at 3. So I'm going to plug in 3 for x. So then 3 minus 2 to the 5th is 1 to the 5th. 0.2 over 5 factorial is 1 fifth over 5 factorial, which is going to be 1 fifth divided by 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. 5 times 4 times 3 times 6 times 1 is 120. 120 times 5 is 600. So this error, I'm running out of space, is less than or equal to 1 six hundredth. That means that if I use a fourth degree Taylor centered at 2, I will be apart from the real value of f of 3 by no more than 1 six hundredth. And if that's close enough for me, that means I can stop writing at the fourth degree term and I'm close enough to what I need. Okay, let's do another one. So number two says a function f has derivatives of all orders for all real numbers. The values of f and its first four derivatives at three are given in the following table. Cool. Write a third degree Taylor polynomial for f at three and use it to approximate f of 2.5. Okay, we can do that. So if I want to write a third degree Taylor, I need something over 0 factorial x minus 3 to the 0. Something over 1 factorial x minus 3 to the 1. And I'm going to keep going. And then remember your numerators for your Taylor polynomial come from your derivatives. So 6, negative 10, 16 negative 24, and I don't need the 32. Cool. All right. Then it says use that to approximate f of 2.5. Okay, so that means I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to plug in 2.5. So I'm going to write this. I'm going to write f of x is approximately that. f of 2.5 is approximately, and at this point, I am going to use the calculator. You won't see this, but I'm going to do it off to the side here. Um, I'm going to put this into the calculator. And if you want, you can do the same. You probably won't see it because I'm not sharing that part of my screen. And so at this moment, while I'm waiting for it to load, I'll tell you a joke. How do you get four elephants into a Mini Cooper? It is easy. Two in the front seat two in the back seat. Um, how do you know if there's an elephant in your refrigerator? I'm typing and telling a joke at the same time. How do you know that there's an elephant in your refrigerator? Uh, that's easy. When you open the door, you'll notice that there are footprints on the butter. How do you know if there are two elephants in your refrigerator? 
How do you know if there's two elephants in your refrigerator? Uh, that's also easy. They giggle a lot at night. Um, I'm still typing. How do you know if there are three elephants in your refrigerator? How do you know if there's three elephants in your refrigerator? Um, the door won't close. That's too many elephants. Um, the door won't close. And how do you know if there are four elephants in your refrigerator? There's an empty mini, mini Cooper on your front lawn. Okay, um, I got 13.5, but I was honestly typing and telling a joke at the same time. So that might be right. It might be wrong. Who knows? But you got some good jokes out of it. All right. Then what do I have left? It says the fourth derivative of f satisfies the inequality that the fourth derivative is always less than or equal to 48 for x is greater than or equal to 2. Use the Lagrange error bound to show that the approximation found in part a differs from f of 2.5 by no more than an eighth. In other words, I got an estimate of 13.5 show that I am no more apart from the real value than 0.125, which is 1 eighth. Okay, the Lagrange error bound says that the error is less than or equal to the maximum value of the next derivative. We stopped at x cubed, so I want the maximum value of the fourth derivative, and that's 48. And if you're thinking, wait, Mrs. Weber, why did you use the 48 and not the 32? Because I don't need the 32. The 32 is the actual fourth derivative at x equals 3. The Lagrange error bound says you want to use the maximum value of the fourth derivative somewhere between 2 and 2.5, and they're telling me that that's 48, so that's what I use. So I'm going to use the maximum value of the next derivative divided by the next factorial. We stopped at x cubed, so 4 factorial. And then I'm going to do 2.5 minus 2 to the fourth. And so if I type that in off screen, I have 48 divided by 4 factorial um, times negative 0.5 to the fourth. And I got exactly 0.125. And there it is. Ta-da! All right, let's do another one. So if you turn the page again, all of this is about that Lagrange error bound. And if you're wondering, well, Mrs. River, how do I knew, know when to do the Lagrange error bound? Easy. When they say to do it. <laughs> Seriously, they're going to tell you when to do Lagrange error bound. You should not have to guess. Every time they're going to ask about Lagrange error bound, they'll say Lagrange error bound. There you go. All right, uh, number three, let f be a polynomial. No, pardon me. Let f be a function that has derivatives of all orders on all real numbers. And let P3 of X be the third degree Taylor polynomial for F about X equals zero. Okay, so that's a McMorin series because it's centered at zero. Um, that series converges at one and the nth derivative is less than or equal to N over N plus one for all derivatives between the first derivative and the fourth derivative inclusive and for all values of X. Okay, fine. Of the following, which is the smallest value of k for which the Lagrange error bound guarantees that f of 1 minus p3 of 1 is less than or equal to k? What? Now, I say what. I'm play acting. I know what they're talking about. But you're not going to know what they're talking about. That's four lines of nonsense with a whole bunch of scary looking notation in there. You're fine. You're going to be fine. What we're going to do is say, you know what? Forget about all the words I don't know. I do know what Lagrange error bound means. I know Lagrange error bound means that I need to do the maximum value of the next derivative over n plus 1 factorial times x minus c or a or whatever. I'm using c for the center to the n plus 1. So at least I know what that means. Well, let's see. They say let p3 be a third degree polynomial. So that must mean if I'm doing Lagrange error bound, I'm going to use number four. So this error is going to be less than or equal to the maximum value of the fourth derivative over four factorial x minus my center, which is zero, to the fourth. Okay, let's see. Oh, well, look at that. They gave me a value 
for the fourth derivative right here. So if I plug 4 in for n, the maximum value of the fourth derivative is going to be 4 fifths. I'm dividing that by 4 factorial. And, oh, well, let's see. We're evaluating f of 1 and then subtracting p of 1. In other words, I'm finding the difference between a function and the polynomial that mimics that function. That's the error at x equals 1. That's all that fancy inequality means. It means find the error at 1. Oh, okay. So that means 1 is what I'm estimating. So x is 1. And so what I really have is 4 over 5 times 4 factorial, which is 4 over 5 factorial. Well, that's 4 over 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. The 4s will cancel. 5 times 3 is 15, times 2 is 30. I'm going to get 1 30th. Okay, which of these is 1 30th? Oh, they, don't, they didn't simplify it. Oh, look at that. Maybe I don't need to. I have 4 fifths divided by 4 factorial. That's the same thing as B. So I'm pausing there. Your screen didn't freeze. I'm pausing because I want you to take a second and say, all right, what, what just happened? We just saw that it said do Lagrange error bound. So we set up Lagrange error bound. And then one by one, we started trying to tick off the boxes so that we didn't feel overwhelmed by what looks like a scary question all at once. Okay? Because I take it as my personal responsibility to teach you how to understand calculus. My secondary responsibility is then to help you use that knowledge to pass what the AP exam is going to throw at you. That's what I try to do in this question. I'm hoping that first you understand what Lagrange error bound means. That if you want to find the error, if you want to find the most you're going to be off by, you use the maximum value of the next derivative, divide by n, factor one fact, n plus 1 factorial, and then multiply by x minus your center to the n plus 1, where n is what you're asked. Oh my God. Pick your variables, Mrs. Bibber. Rewind. The error is the quotient of the highest value of your next derivative over n plus 1 factorial times x minus c, what you're estimating, minus what you're centered at, to the n plus 1. I did it. Okay. That's what I need you to understand. The next thing I need you to understand is when they ask you about it on the AP, you are going to do Lagrange error bound when they say so. And if they say so, it means you have all the information you need. You just have to go on a scavenger hunt to find it. Okay? Okay. Um, I didn't want this video to be too long. Number four is something that if you want, um, what I'm going to do is I am going to do it right now. You can either stop the video now or you can watch me do number four, but it is not necessary. It's just interesting. Okay. Number four says, show that the McLaurin polynomial for sine X converges to sine X for all X values. In other words, if we write out all the terms, there won't be any error. Okay, so here's how I'm going to do that. The McLaurin polynomial for sine x, sine is an odd function, so I have all my odd x's. Negative 1 to the n, x to the 2n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial. So that's sine x. So if I want to show that the McLaurin polynomial for sine x converges for all x values, I want to show that the n plus 1th derivative, maxed out, divided by n plus 1 factorial times x minus c to the n plus 1, I want to show that as n approaches infinity, in other words, as I write out every single term, the error is 0 that there is no point at which my polynomial is going to shoot off into space, but my sine curve is going to keep going. So if I do that for the sine curve, I want to think about, well, what's the highest value of the n plus 1th derivative? Well, for a sine curve, my derivatives are, the original is sine, 
cosine, negative sine, negative cosine, sine, cosine, negative sine, negative cosine. If I evaluate any one of those four things, sine, cosine, negative sine, or negative cosine, the maximum value that a sine or a cosine curve can ever get to is one because that's the highest value in the range. So this numerator's gonna be one. Then I'm gonna divide by n plus one factorial. Then it's a Maclaurin series, so c is gonna be zero, and I'm gonna have an x here to the n plus one. With me so far? Okay. If I rearrange this, just because I'm running out of room, that's going to have me put x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial. Well, if I choose an x that's between negative 1 and 1, this is going to have to converge. Because if x is between negative 1 and 1, that's a fraction that I'm raising to a really big power. It's going to shrink. It's going to go to 0. That part's easy. But what if x is 1 or larger than 1? I'm going to be raising it to a huge power. Well, here's one thing I need to show you. And honestly, it's just something I'm showing you. And you can just take as fact. The order of magnitude of things that grow is often written as FEPLT. Factorials grow faster than anything. Exponentials grow the next fastest. Exponential. There we go. Grow the next polynomials grow the next fastest, um, logs grow the next fastest, and trig, with the exception of tan, grow the next fastest. So in my numerator, I'm going to have something that's exponential. I'm going to have like 4 to the infinity. But on the bottom, I'm going to have infinity factorial. And let me, let me explain why the factorial is bigger than the exponential. The exponential, if I had 4 to the infinity, is an infinite number of 4s multiplied together. It's pretty big. Infinity factorial means that I have infinity times infinity minus 1 times infinity minus 2. In other words, I effectively have infinite infinities that are multiplied together as compared to infinite 4s, which are multiplied together. That infinite infinities is going to be way bigger than the infinite fours. So on top, yeah, I have infinity. But on the bottom, holy crap, I have infinity. So this is going to go to zero. And there you go. So no matter what, sine x converges for all x values. If that didn't make sense, it's okay. But that is a proof that if I kept writing, I would have the whole thing. So thank you for listening. I am done with this video. I hope you enjoyed some very bad elephant jokes. Um, and I will leave you with two more. Um, how come you never see, not two, I think three. How come you never see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're so good at it. Hopefully you're laughing. It's one of my favorite jokes. How come you never see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're good at it. How come elephant paint their toenails red? Because they like to hide in cherry trees. How did Tarzan die? He was picking cherries. All right, I'm done with the bad elephant jokes. I hope everybody has a wonderful day. I also hope that this recorded well, because if it didn't, I'm going to be really, really upset right now. And yeah, everybody have a wonderful day. I'll see y'all later. Bye.